Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health webinar series, Moving Towards Cultural and Linguistic Competence, From Knowing to Doing. I'm Kathy Lazier at the University of South Florida, the co-director of the Cultural and Linguistic Competence Hub of the TA Network. The CLC Hub is comprised of the Center for Community Learning and the University of South Florida, both core partners of the TA Network. Today's presentation, Language Assistance Toolkit, is an orientation and introduction to a toolkit designed for behavioral health practitioners to better understand language proficiency and multilingualism in behavioral health care, to address language tools in proficiency assessments, and also present an action and implementation plan for language identification tools and strategies. The toolkit is based on the National Standards for Cultural Linguistically Appropriate Services, known as CLASS in Health and Healthcare, standards five through eight related to communication and language assistance for individuals seeking behavioral health care. Ongoing self-assessments are also presented as well as the next to challenge you in reflecting on the toolkit content to appropriately address the needs of the children and families that you serve. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Maria Elena Villar from Colvian Consulting um, to introduce today's presenters. Maria? Thank you, Kathy. So my name is Maria Elena Vidal. I'm part of the Covian Consulting team, and we are collaborating with the Cultural and Linguistic Competence Hub that is made up of Catalina Booth, Miriam Monsalves Serna, and Kathy Lazier. And the members of our team who worked on this toolkit are Maritza Concha, Patricia Herodier, and Lauren Azevedo. And today, um, Lauren Azevedo and myself will be presenting the toolkit to you. And so I will pass it on to Lauren, who will present the agenda and the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we get started. Um, this is Lauren Azevedo, and I will help present uh, the material in this webinar along with my colleague you just heard, Dr. VR. Uh, the webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, and um, it will cover an introduction, um, understanding language proficiency and multilingualism and behavioral health care, We'll present this material in a continuum um, which will unfold uh, through the webinar. And that will cover individual and organizational assessments, um, evaluation and monitoring, and finally um, two excerpts uh, from the toolkit from the uh, vignettes that we have um, available again for you in the toolkit. So let's get started and start with um, class standards. What are class standards? They are culturally and linguistically appropriate services or class. Um, that aim to improve quality of care and increase health equity. Um, they're intended to provide a reference and a framework of recommended practices for appropriate service delivery um, for you and your organization. So we can think of class standards as a starting point for your organization, um, also a recommendation for service agencies, and finally a guideline, um, which is set in place by the federal government, and that is to ensure that there's no discrimination um, in your organization due to language or culture. Um, so moving on, this toolkit addresses and responds to class standards specifically five through eight, um, and those are related to communication and language assistance. So they're listed here so you can see um, class standard five is offer language assistance to individuals who have limited English proficiency or from here out, we'll, we'll identify them as LEP and or other communication needs at no cost to them to facilitate timely access to all health care um, and services. And then six, to inform all individuals of the availability of language assistance services clearly and in their language, um, verbally and in writing in their preferred language. Seven, ensure the competence of individuals providing language assistance recognizing that the use of untrained individuals and or minors as interpreters um, should be avoided. And then finally, eight, provide easy to understand um, both print and multimedia materials and signage um, in the preferred languages. So let's go ahead and get started with why, um, why do we need this toolkit. A, a few facts for you. First, there's no official um, national language in the United States. Um, in fact, over 60 million people in the United States speak a language other than English at home. Uh, we know there's a growing number of non-English speaking citizens in the U.S. from the U.S. Census, and we know also that these numbers are rising, and they're going to continue to rise in the coming years. 
Uh, we know racial and ethnic minorities face additional barriers in seeking specifically behavioral health care. Um, and we also know that research shows health outcomes are better when utilizing uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate services, class services, um, utilizing the class standards. We know minorities are underserved in the current behavioral health care setting, and LEP individuals uh, generally report lower satisfaction with medical encounters. They receive less discussion and follow-up on treatment, and they receive different rates of diagnostic testing um, than English proficient individuals. So these these facts are, um, they can be surprising, so these are some of the reasons why um, we've invested time into this toolkit and we're presenting it to you today. And then finally, compared to English proficient individuals in similar circumstances, LEP individuals uh, with mental disorders are significantly less likely to identify a need for mental health services and also sometimes experience a longer wait time um, of having untreated disorders and use fewer health care services. Uh, for mental disorders. So again, these facts, um, again, just show us some of the health disparities that are relevant for LEP individuals in the behavioral health care setting. So let's move on to um, specifically the purpose of, of this toolkit. We want to um, offer um, you as a provider um, information that, so that you can offer the most appropriate and meaningful language assistance services, and also culturally appropriate services in your organization. So the language assistance toolkit here takes a practical approach, again, to addressing language proficiency and multilingualism and behavioral health care, and also um, the cultural aspects of language and how these issues can impact health disparities. So the three purposes listed here, as you can see, um, of this toolkit first to increase understanding of the barriers faced by LEP individuals seeking behavioral health care services, um, also to better equip staff, uh, staff members to provide lingu linguistically and culturally appropriate services, and also provide tools to address the disparities that still exist among LEP individuals and in behavioral health care. So um, as briefly mentioned, the toolkit is specifically intended for practitioners working in child-serving behavioral health care settings, and that can include, but is of course not limited to service coordinators, administrators, um, front office staff, et cetera. So the content within the toolkit emphasizes not only, again, the importance of language, but also cultural competence uh, related to language access. So by adopting this information that we're presenting today um, into your organization and some of the sample tools that we'll go over um, into the everyday culture of your service environment, um, behavioral health care organizations can provide more appropriate services and also improve their quality of care and its outcomes that you're providing to um, individuals. So um, the next slide we're, we're going to talk about in this webinar a continuum of understanding and incorporating language proficiency and multilingualism in behavioral health care. And as you can see, it's a cyclical process um, that, that we're constantly in um, as an organization. We're, we're always in one of these phases trying to improve and better ourselves. So the first phase is at the very top, um, understanding language proficiency and multilingualism in behavioral health care. So within this first phase, um, we're going to go over understanding some of the barriers that can lead to disparities in your organization, um, different types of communication, and understanding that uh, communication types vary across individuals. Um, the role of culture and translations and language barriers, and also um, how your organization uses interpreters and translators. So these are some of the things that we'll cover in phase one. Moving on to phase two, which is on the right-hand side, that's conducting individual and organizational assessments. Um, and then on the bottom, phase three, is implementing language assistant tools and services in your organization. And so we'll present some of these tools for you that you can um, use or modify for, for use in your organization. And then finally, the fourth phase on the left-hand side, conducting ongoing um, evaluation and language assistance policies in your organization. So briefly, um, as I just mentioned, what the first phase, um, what we'll cover today, understanding some of the barriers that lead to disparities, um, defining communication and the different types of communication that, that, that are there, explaining the role of culture and translation, um, 
also determining uh, who is an LEP individual and, and who, who makes that call in your organization. Uh, reducing language barriers, um, using and uh, hiring tr uh, translators and interpreters, and the difference between certified interpreters versus certified translators. Understanding levels of language proficiency, uh, prioritizing translation materials and what should be translated, what materials in your office that um, should be in different languages and what languages they should be in. And finally, um, collecting information from LEP individuals. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, to meet the needs of immigrant populations in terms of behavioral health care, we have to first um, understand some of the disparities in care that, that are currently out there. So firstly, we know that there are erroneous beliefs about um, people of certain races and ethnicities, um, sometimes fragmentation of services, which could cause um, uh, individuals to have multiple contacts with different systems. So basically a lack of coordination between services and also a lack of communication, and which could lead to duplication of services. Um, a lack of availability of services, also financial limitations, making some services maybe inaccessible because of cost, uh, different in insurance statuses and immigration statuses that could also cause maybe a, a fear of seeking services. But we also know, um, as you can see on this slide, that there's additional um, barriers that racial and ethnic minorities are facing. And these include mistrust and fear of treatment based on maybe negative experiences in the past, um, cultural beliefs about illnesses and health that mainstream providers um, just may not understand. Um, these ideas are actually explored in greater detail in another toolkit that we have, the Health Beliefs Toolkit, and we also have a webinar that coincides with that toolkit. So if you're interested in learning more, you can definitely check that out. Um, additionally, racism and discrimination from individuals and other institutions. Um, certainly these may be intentional or unintentional behaviors or policies that you have in place. Um, language barriers that may limit understanding communication differences that um, may challenge understanding, and finally, different sorts of behavior and um, different sorts of help-seeking behavior that can potentially be misinterpreted maybe as ignorance or noncompliance. So although uh, maybe not all of these challenges are directly related to language access, they all do play a role in the experiences of people uh, with limited English proficiency. So it's very important that um, organizations and also individual practitioners consider these disparities that, um, that can cause barriers when addressing language access policies. So it's very important to have open discussions about how language barriers can affect individuals seeking behavioral health care services and also maybe the risks that may pose on the quality of care. And also for you um, as an organization to consider the costs and benefits of um, overcoming these language barriers. Um, so I said we were going to briefly cover some of uh, communication. Communication is very important, and we know um, it includes not only language, meaning speaking and writing language, but it also includes paralanguage, which um, can be gestures, which is maybe pointing, um, changing in tones of voices, and how um, your voice changes in conversation. Uh, kinesics, which is body language, how you um, are expressing yourself, your posture, uh, things of that nature. Also proximics, proximics which is the space um, between two people when they're talking, what's a comfortable space for you may vary and may be different from what somebody else thinks is a, a comfortable space in conversation. Also clothing, the type of clothes that you wear, how you, uh, how you dress. And finally, uh, body decorations, such as tattoos or makeup or maybe piercings, any other sort of, of decoration that uh, you have on your body that is how you present yourself. So again, it's very important to examine our own interpretations of paralanguage and understand that these types of behaviors, um, they may have different meanings across cultures and across individuals, specifically. Well, let's, um, let's move on. The next slide. We just talked a little bit about communication. We know communication is absolutely essential to ensure that individuals receive effective, individualized, timely, efficient, and also even equitable care. So inadequate communication with LEP individuals can impact the quality of care that they received. 
Um, specifically, as you can see here, poor communication can affect um, adequate monitoring of symptoms, of treatments, um, of medication received, um, can also and, uh, affect understanding the experiences and points of view and explanations of LEP individuals um, in conversation, and also understanding the cultural context of, of a behavior. So um, obviously communication is very important, and that's why we've included it in um, phase one of our continuum. So moving on uh, within phase one, who determines if an individual is LEP? Um, that should be the staff at the very first point of contact with that individual in your organization. Uh, and they should determine if the person is LEP, they should determine that person's primary language. Um, they should know and be trained on how to request the appropriate language ac uh, assistance services. And they can do that in multiple ways. One way is through um, I seek language identification cards. We have a, uh, a couple of these pictures here on the slide for you. The language um, identification cards, I seek cards, are, are put in your office so that individuals can point to the language that they speak. You might not speak their language, but they can point you know, to say, I, I speak Spanish, and, and here's the sentence, I speak Spanish. So you, you can identify. Um, as a staff member, okay, this person needs um, Spanish services, et cetera. Um, other ways include um, language identification posters may be displayed in your reception area or your intake area um, in your office. Also, um, verification of foreign language proficiency by qualified bilingual staff. And this can happen in multiple ways. It can happen um, in person. Um, maybe you have a certified bilingual staff member who works in your office. It can happen over the telephone or also through uh, video interpretation services. Another way is through verification of foreign language proficiency by a qualified interpreter. So again, this can happen in person, over the telephone, or even through video identification services. And finally, through a self-identification um, of the LEP individual or by a companion of the individual, a, a parent or um, family member or you know, whoever is with that individual um, may be able to identify the specific language that they speak and that they need services for. So at this point in the presentation, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Dr. VR, who's going to um, discuss with you a, a little bit more about interpreters and translators and the differences between interpreters and translators and uh, the use of those, um, those services in your office. Thank you, Lauren. Can you, if you could advance to the next slide. So before I get into interpreters and translators, I want to tell you about the first tool, one of the, the tools in the toolkit, and that is something to ensure that everyone on the staff is aware of, of the language assistance policies and procedures. For example, if you have policies to work with translators, and we will talk more about that in the, in the next section, if you have policies to identify languages, if you have policies for document translation, your staff need to be trained on this. So the first tool we want to share is a tool for supervisors and human resource staff to, to ensure that the frontline staff and all staff are receiving adequate training in all aspects of language assistance. So for example, the first point would check that all staff members receive mandatory periodic trainings on the organization's language access policy. The next one ensures that staff receive training on the language assistance services provided to LP individuals through the organization. The third point makes sure that the policies and procedures are made readily available and that the staff is trained not only on what the services are, but how to access those trainings. The last two points have to do with interpretation. Bilingual staff who communicate in language to LEP individuals may in some occasions um, translate or interpret information, but there should be a policy and they should be trained as to what information and in what situations it is okay for them to do that. And then finally, we think that it's not only training about policies and uh, services, but also the cultural competent piece that where 
staff are encouraged to think about their own biases and how this could affect how they treat and how they provide services to LEP individuals. Next slide, please. So the main strategies to reduce language barriers in service pro provider settings is through the use of interpreters and translators. So first, let me distinguish between interpreters and translators. Sometimes that is not clear. An interpreter is present during an interaction. They could be in, there in person, by phone, or by video conference. And they facilitate communication because they are proficient in both languages. So they are there while the communication is taking place. Translators um, usually translate text, documents, scripts, um, that uh, that are then distributed or, or used. But so interpreters are there in person while the interaction is taking place, while translators um, translate documents from one language into another. So they both require that the person be proficient and fluent and skilled in two languages, but the actual skill is slightly different. So providing qualified interpreters is a very important strategy. Another one is hiring bilingual or multilingual staff and clinicians that can provide the services and the information in language. And that has some benefits, but also some limitations. And the third is to provide written and audiovisual materials in the appropriate languages that your uh, service population speaks. Next slide, please. So translators and interpreters are subject to specific codes of conduct. They're often privy to confidential information, to clinical information. And it's very important that whoever is doing this takes that responsibility seriously. You want to select translators and interpreters who are well trained in their specific skill, but also understand the ethics and the subject matter language. For example, if you are in a behavioral health provider setting, you cannot assume that any translator will, un will know all the relevant terms and laws and jargon and acronyms related to your subject matter. So when you're hiring translators or interpreters, it's important to ask about certifications, training, best practices, and experiences, and in, in what fields. So the quality of the interpretation should be the primary driver of the hiring decision and not necessarily cost or convenience. To the extent possible, you should try to assess your interpreters to ensure that they are appropriate for the population that you're working with. And as I said before, it's important to provide training to your interpreter on jargon specific to your field and to your agency, any rules, and especially provisions of confidentiality when they are when they have access to private confidential data. Next. So is it ever OK to use staff members as interpreters if you have bilingual staff? Well, it's always preferable to use professional interpreters if possible. Um, it's more objective, more professional. It, um, it separates the different types of of roles that a person has. But if you have bilingual staff, why, you know, it's at, there are times when it is appropriate for them to do that. The first thing you have to do is ensure that they are qualified. So if you are not, if you do not speak the language in question, it is hard for you to assess whether your staff is proficient and the level of proficiency in that, in that particular language. Because there are different levels of proficiency. You may be able to speak a language to communicate basic things about, about where's the bathroom and here's this form. And then you need another level of training to be able to provide technical or clinical type of information. So if you have staff that are bilingual, they should be assessed. And they should be assessed to their proficiency in the area that they are supposed to be providing interpretation for. And, if they, and being bilingual is not enough to be a skilled translator or interpreter, they, if, if a staff member is going to be playing that role, they should receive special training so that they understand the specific roles, skills, and codes of ethics. So what's a successful interpretation 
A successful interpretation is one that faithfully and accurately conveys the meaning of the oral language of the person speaking and that reflects the style, the tone, and the cultural context of the message without adding meaning or information and without omitting meaning or information. It is very common for inexperienced translators to try to explain things in their own words and try to tell one person what they think the other person meant. This is not exactly the role. There are times when, when interpreters may also be cultural brokers. But if, your role, if a person's role is to interpret, they should be interpreting the language. And the person who is speaking through an interpreter should be directing their, their comment and should be looking at the person to whom they are providing services and not looking at and speaking to the interpreter. So these are skills that also come with experience. Next slide. So when you're working with interpreters, it's also important to understand the role of culture in translation and interpretation. So both in, in, interpreters and people working with interpreters should understand this. There's cultural differences in spoken language, not only between groups, but also between individuals. So just because two people share the same language, you should not assume that they share the same culture and the same values and will understand each other immediately and, and clearly. So there are things that may vary across cultures even if people are speaking the same language. And also cross-cultural differences exist in nonverbal language. So if you are participating in, a, in communication that has an interpreter, you may be looking at the person to whom you're, you're providing services and try to interpret their body language. But keep in mind that, as Lauren explained, um, nonverbal language often varies by culture. So be careful when you're interpreting things like silences, pauses, eye contact, avoiding eye contact, etc., cetera, or, or tone of voice or volume, because it may not mean what it means in your culture. And so be careful with drawing meaning from nonverbals if you're not very familiar with the culture. Next. So other things to consider, especially if you uh, are not very familiar with the other language that is being interpreted, there are some words and phrases that cannot be directly translated. And you, it may seem odd that something that took you one minute to say takes 30 seconds or five minutes to translate. There are things that do not directly translate. And it, makes several, it may take several sentences and questions to convey a meaning for, their, for which there is no word. That doesn't mean that the meaning cannot be uh, interpreted. It can be, but it may not be as fast as you hope. So, and it, English uses many idiomatic expressions and slang that cannot be translated literally. Well, of course, they can be translated literally, but they would not have the meaning that they are expected to have. And there are concepts that vary across culture that may not vary with language that you must keep in mind. So an, an example of that is time. So something like, in a little while or a long time ago, you can translate those words, but the meaning may mean different things by de depending on the culture. So take some time to make sure that conceptions of time, things like expressing pain, and other things that um, that maybe language, you know, translating words is not enough to really understand meaning. And then also think about accents and what role they play. If you you have you can have people that speak the same language but have different accents. Does that come into play? Does that bring up any stigma or biases that may be there? Think about your own biases and perceptions of people with accents. Do you have a different reaction to someone that speaks with a Chinese accent, that speaks English with a Chinese accent, or that speaks English with a Spanish accent, or a German accent, right? So, so those things come into play both across languages and within languages. Next, please. So the second tool that I want to talk, tell you about is a tool for working with interpreters. On the right, there is a checklist of statements of ideal scenarios when hiring and recruiting interpreters. 
So this would be something to use with your organization to determine to what extent you're following these best practices when hiring and recruiting. So for example, the statement, my organization recruits only certified interpreters from credible institutions. That might require some discussion of what you consider certified and what you consider credible. Um, if you hire, if you hire translators and interpreters that are not certified, what quality standards do you have in place? Another statement is my organization ensures that interpreters comply with a code of ethics and standards of behavior. That implies that you have a code of ethics for translators and a way to monitor that. My organization is familiar with each or interpreter's ethical obligations and professional responsibilities. So these are items for you to think about and these should be part of your policies and your training. On the left hand side you have statements related to evaluating working, uh, interpreters. So for example, the first statement, my organization assesses the performance of interpreters on a quarterly basis. And of course you would adapt this to your own, um, to your own context. But do you have a way to assess the performance of interpreters or are you just assuming that the interpretation is working? The second, my organization develops satisfaction surveys. Do you have a way for LEP individuals that use interpreter services to provide feedback? So this is an example of, of one of the tools that, um, that you can use to ensure that you have policies and procedures in place to work with interpreters. Next. So as I explained, interpreting is one thing that happens in real time when people are interacting and translation um, refers to translating documents. So which documents need to be translated? Do you need to translate absolutely everything that your agency puts out in English? Does that also need to be translated into other languages? That can seem very overwhelming. So to, to think about this, there's something called the four-factor analysis and decisions to translate documents should balance these four factors. First, the number of LEP individuals served or encountered in an eligible service population. So how many people are there of the different languages in your service population? And in general, if you have at least 5% of your service population that require, that require that have a particular dominant language and are limited English proficient, that would be um, a, a, a language to prioritize. The next is the frequency of contact between LEP individuals and your program. So you may have a large number of individuals that speak dif a different language, but they may not use your services. So of course that would be something to take into consideration. The nature and importance of the program activity or service. So services that are considered important include behavioral health care, health care, education. If the, there are maybe other services, perhaps recreational services, that although not unimportant, would have a different level of priority in terms of having to translate for a particular group. And then of course all of these things have to be balanced against the resources available and cost because the class standards stipulate that these services must be provided at no cost to the person receiving the service. So you would need to make sure these four things are balanced to determine what to translate. Next. However, there are some documents that if you have at least 5% of your target population that speaks a particular language that you absolutely must um, be translated. These are documents that are considered vital documents. So this is another tool that you can use to make sure that you have at least these vital documents for groups for whom for, that, that account for at least 5% of your target population. And these include application forms, consent and complaint forms, notices of rights and disciplinary action, notices advising people of the availability of free language assistance, and letters or notices that require a response from the beneficiary or client. So at the very least, when you're thinking of what to translate, because you may think, should I translate my promotional poster? Should I translate my website? Should I translate my form? Should I translate my disclaimers? You can use this tool to help you determine what needs to be translated. Next.
So another tool when you're looking at translation of materials is looking, again, at the cultural competence of it. So in this particular example, we have on the right side of the screen just a sample of one of the tools that we have used in our project, which is a photonovela or graphic story. And it was developed with the community in the language of the community and using people from the community as actors. But um, you know, there are still things that we should think about when we're putting out information that we might think is great. Our, our, the people that worked on it might think is great. But are we sure that it's not causing any, any harm? So here's a tool to think of translated printed materials that you might use. So the first is, do the people in the images reflect the LEP target audience? So do, do the people actually look like the folks that you are serving? Do the images make assumptions about the target audience that may not hold after the text is translated? So you may have something that has very nice images with very nice text in English, but when the language is, is translated, the images no longer go. Does the text include idioms or jargon that may be difficult to translate? And if that is the case, you make sure that you have people from your target audience check that those things were translated in a way that the meaning was adequately translated. Because like I said before, you can, tra you can literally translate everything, but that doesn't mean the meaning will be translated. Does the material reinforce negative or exaggerated stereotypes? Does the material contain controversial or politically loaded language? Is the target audience represented as other or exaggeratedly different from the normally accepted mainstream? So these are things to keep in mind, and, and, and it emphasizes the importance of getting feedback from the population you're targeting, from others that might be looking at that population and, and um, maybe reinforcing stereotypes. So this is a tool to help you think through when you translate promotional uh, materials and things with images. Next. So that is about understanding language and multilingualism in behavioral health settings. The, the second phase is conducting assessments to see where you are. Where is your organization in terms of language assistance services? So the first is ensuring that there's policies. So how do you assess your language assistance policy? We propose a tool that looks at three different criteria for assessing policies. First is directness, directness, the extent to which the organization has policies and is carrying them out. The second is manageability, the extent to which the policies are managed and overseen. The third is visibility, the extent to which people who need these policies know that they exist and know how to use them. So in the next slide, we show you another tool to assess your language assistance policies. So first, you have to figure out what those policies are. Hopefully, they're written. And if they're not, they should be. And then um, ask yourself these questions. Use these checklists to help you determine whether your policies are robust. So the, this first checklist is about directness. My, for example, the first one would be my organization offers language assistance through the use of certified interpreters. Is that something that exists or not? Or is it something that maybe should be worked on? My organization provides translated documents in the languages spoken by our target population. The third, my organization seeks funding to meet the needs of LEP individuals. So this is, again, I'm not going to read them all, but this is a set of stat of criteria that you can use to assess the directness of your policies. The next page shows your the criteria to assess manageability. It's not enough to have policies. They need to be overseen. So some of the, of the criteria there would be, my organization participates in a task force to address the needs of LEP individuals. Maybe there isn't a task force in your area. Or maybe you need a task force or a committee within your organization. Who is in that task force or in that committee? Is your internal committee made up of diverse staff representing multiple languages? Does your 
organization recruit and hire bilingual staff as needed? So these are questions that are not um, intended to, to generate a score. They are intended to be a tool to help you assess the, your existing policies and to identify policies that you need to develop. And then finally, the next one related to policy has to do with visibility. So do people know that these, that these policies exist? For example, the first statement asks, are these policies and procedures on your website? The second one, are these policies and procedures in your office, posted in your office? Um, does your organization offer language assistance in its automated telephone system? So these are, again, the, the ideal policy complies with all of these criteria, and these are tools to help you assess your policy. Next. So the first phase is understanding how multilingualism and bilingualism affects services. The second is assessing your own policies. And the third phase has to do with implementing these policies. So we have provided tools, but the third phase is on you to, to adapt these tools to your own reality. So the tools that are, create, that are provided in this toolkit address four different levels of analysis and four different levels of implementation of language assistance policies. So the first one is at the individual level, where you want feedback from the LEP individual to see how they are getting, if they are getting the language assistance services and so they can assess the quality. The second level is at the practitioner level. Are people getting the training that they need? Do they know the policies? Do they know how to access the services? And do they know the issues related to language assistance? The third is with the services provided. So for are, are there interpreters and translators that are being hired in an adequate manner? Um, are, are the correct documents being translated? And finally, the larger level is the organizational level and the policies are the policies in place so we've provided tools that address all of those levels and the third phase is using those tools and the idea is not to use them as cookie cutter and and, and that they are supposed to work the same in every organization now they're guiding tools that you can adapt and should adapt with your team to assess to understand your language access needs to, uh, to understand where you are with policies and then implementing policies. So the fourth phase, is closing the circle, is conducting evaluation of your policies. So it's not enough to have policies and to implement them. You have to see if they're working, and that means creating a mechanism of feedback. So it's important to monitor the effectiveness to make sure First, that LEP individuals have meaningful access to the programs and activities that you're offered. And second, that the agency is improving, is continuously improving its language access plan so that, they can, so that services continue to be available. So assessments of the plan could include analyzing current and historical data, data of your, of your client language needs, of their services that they request and in what languages they, they request it, and how things have changed over time with respect to using the services. And it's important to observe the provision of language assistance services through audits or testing, not just assume that, um, that it's going well. There's, is there a mechanism to monitor that the language assistance services are effective? Are you surveying staff on how often they need our language assistance services and if they know how to use it and have they had any challenges in obtaining them? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, do you actually ask your, the individuals seeking services and receiving services in the organization how the language assistance services went? Next. So the next tool is sample items to include in a client satisfaction survey to ask about language assistance. So for example, you might add, just as if you, if you ask them or if they received the services they needed 
or if they or if policies were explained to them, you can also ask them if they found brochures, handouts, or other printed materials in their in their language. If the intake forms and other important documents were in their language, if the, uh, the language appropriate interpreter was made available for intake, initial evaluation, appointment, treatment interventions as needed. If they were ever asked questions that they could not understand, if the quality of those translations and interpretations were good, if they felt that respected in their language. So then this tool are sample items that can be included in a client satisfaction survey that addresses language assistance services. Next. And then finally, another aspect of monitoring a plan goes beyond your organization. Updating community demographics, understanding maybe new groups that are coming that may be using your services in the near future. Collaborating with local resources and considering new resources. Are there new organizations or potential partners in your area that might somehow change your language assistance plan? Maybe there's a new service you can refer out to. Do you have a way of monitoring your agency's response to complaints or suggestions regarding language assistance? And are you soliciting feedback from community stakeholders, not only those receiving services, but other organizations that might serve these groups to see what they have to say about your language assistance services? Next. So those are the tools included in the toolkit. And the last section is a series of five vignettes or, or scenarios where an organization would have to deploy their language assistance policies. For, uh, and they're meant to be a tool to, to role play within your organization how you would um, react to these, to these scenarios. And Lauren is going to explain that a little more. So thank you so much, Dr. Villar. Um, again, the last section of the toolkit will briefly go over. We have two excerpts. Um, from the toolkit uh, for you to briefly look over. The first um, is a vignette or, or family story or family scenario um, that you're presented with. And so the point of this is just to walk through um, the tools that we went over in the toolkit and some information that was presented and, and apply it in a situation. So types of questions here that we're looking at, um, how would you go about helping um, in this situation, um, a specific family, how, how could you serve this family at this appointment? What policies do you have in place um, that could help? And what policies should be in place um, to help in this, in this, um, ex in this example? Um, and then finally, what community resources do you need to have in order to provide um, a culturally and linguistically, linguistically appropriate um, service for these individuals at this appointment? So again, the purpose here of these vignettes is to take what we've uh, presented to you um, in the toolkit and apply them in a situation that you could encounter. Um, so four of the vignettes within the toolkit are, are very similar. And then the fifth one is more like the second vignette that we're presenting here. It's um, an organizational type question. And it puts you um, in the point, and it asks you basically uh, what would you do to translate um, a specific document into a new language. In this, in this specific example, um, they're asking you to translate a materi uh, materials into Spanish and Mandarin. Um, so the questions are a little bit different in this example. What policies do you have in place that would guide the decision um, to translate the material? How would you go about translating um, this material in this example? What policies should be in place um, to ensure that the quality of the translation is is superb. And finally, what resources do you need to have in place in order um, to provide a culturally and linguistically appropriate service um, in this example? So again, these um, are at the end of the toolkit and provide you with a way of, of looking at or thinking about how you can use all of this information and kind of to get you started, jumpstart you into, um, into this material that we've presented today. So this um, this is the end of our presentation. We'd like to thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. Again, uh, we've presented materials covered in the Language Assistance Toolkit. And we specifically uh, today went through the four phases of a continuum that was presented to you, which is understanding and incorporating language proficiency and multilingualism in behavioral health care. 
So for even more information about this topic, there's going to be a language assistance online course, which is um, basically an extension of this material presented to you today. And at this time, we'd like to open it up for any questions you have. There is a chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. You can just type in your questions there. And we can also unmute you off the line if you're um, on a telephone landline and have a question for us. And um, I can read your question, too, if you type it in. So at this point, um, we'll open it up for questions. Okay, um, feel free, again, to use the chat box and type in any questions um, that you have. And as a reminder, the toolkit that we've been referencing is on the bottom of your screen as a file download. And we will um, also send out this um, toolkit in a follow-up email if you didn't have a chance to download it um, today. But if you want to go ahead and download it now, it's a file uh, called Language Assistance Toolkit at the bottom of your screen. and. Um, We'll wait a few more minutes if you can think of any questions for us. Just type them in that chat box or um, feel free to just uh, speak them if you're on a landline phone. Well, oh, this is Kathy. Just um, in case uh, people want to know that this is um, available, it gets archived on the um, TA Network website. Um, that they can put that information will go out in the follow-up email. And as there is a, um, we're having. Okay, I think, Kathy, I think you might have gotten cut off there. But yes, this, uh, this webinar is recorded and um, you can access that on the TA network and any other information um, is out there. Please feel free to contact us if you have any other questions that may arise at a later point. Um, we'll leave it open just a second more for any questions. So if there are no questions, I think that we'll end it here. We are, are, have been faithful to the 60 minutes that we said um, this would take. And our you can always reach us through the TA network and uh, download the toolkit, which is available here through this um, Adobe Connect session and also through the TA network. So thank you all of you for joining us today. And we hope that this is useful and that we will be able to bring these tools back to your organization. Thank you so much.